talk about this book that we, most of us have called the Bible. And it's where we get our information about God and, and our faith and our salvation from. Um, and we're not just going to talk about what the book says, but we're going to talk about the book, the Bible itself, where it came from, its history, how, its history, how it came to be, you know, like it is. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I hope this is not too, uh, like, classroom scholastic. I don't want that to be. There's a lot of information, but it fascinates me, the history and the story of how the Bible came to be what it is. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit, and then we'll break up. And uh, Well, we've already broken up, but we're going to go through some questions. So y'all ready? Yeah. Everybody ready? Yeah. Look at me and nod your head and say, I'm ready. I'm ready. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to talk about the history of the Bible. Um, and the big idea behind this is this, that the Bible is God's word to man, and it's the source of truth. Like, it is, it's, the, it's the plumb line for right and wrong. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is the measuring stick for morality. It's the, it's the you know, it, 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 it defines truth, and it's, it, it is absolutely the source of truth. So um, that's the big idea. But before we just accept that, we're going to kind of go backwards in time, in history, and see where the Bible came from. Because as new believers, one of the things that new believers have to, they have to grab a hold of this, is the spiritual discipline of reading and studying their Bible. I mean, you, you, if you don't get that, you, you just, you're gone. I mean, this is a big, 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 big deal. This is probably the biggest spiritual, spiritual discipline uh, that there is, is reading the Bible and studying the Bible. I know that sounds elementary, but it is such a huge deal because when you come to Christ, you have to start reading God's Word, and that, and that discipline never ends. It should never end. We should always be readers and students of the written Word of God. Amen? Amen. And so we have to get this under the belt. But before we do that, we're going to talk about the history of the Bible and have some appreciation for how it's, it's, it's really a miracle in itself and marvel at how it came to be just a little bit. Um, the first part of the Bible is known as the Pentateuch. Um, it was written by Moses, and it includes the first five books of the Bible. The first five books are known as the Pentateuch, so you can, uh, you can be all smart with that big word, Pentateuch, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, written by Moses. So those are the first five books. Um, by 500 B.C., the 39 books that we know today, known as the Old Testament, were completed and preserved on scrolls, and they were written in the Hebrew language, okay? So the Old Testament, the 39 books that we know today as the Old Testament were written on scrolls in the, lang in the Hebrew language. By the end of the first century, the New Testament had been complete completed. It was written on this material called papyrus, and it was written in the Greek language. So you kind of get a, you know, a broad uh, view of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament's in Hebrew. What was in Hebrew, New Testament was in Greek by the first century. So let's talk a little bit about um, the Bible and the books and how it, uh, what it's gone through, um, how it was compiled. In 367 A.D., the bishop of, of Alexandria, Athanasius, identified and listed the 27 books of the New Testament that were eventually canonized. So in, in, in 367, in the year 367, that was the first time that the New Testament, the books of the New Testament had been identified and put together and compiled. In, in the year 393, the Synod of Hippo in North Africa accepted and approved the list of the 27 books for the New Testament. Uh, the process that, of acceptance and approval is called uh, canonization, or they were canonized. So, and that simply means, like, they made the list. You know, they, they made it in, and they're the books that are going to be included in the Bible. So that happened in the year 393. By 500 A.D., the Bible had been translated into over 500 languages. Amazing. 500 A.D., there was... Uh, the Bible had been translated into 500 languages. But something uh, strange happened after that. Um, over the next 100 years, all of these translations were reeled in by the Catholic Church, and the Bible was only allowed to exist in one language, and that was the Latin language. The Catholic Church in Rome issued a decree that 
any Bible issued in any language other than Latin was actually illegal. So by this time, it was, it was illegal to, carry, to own a Bible that was not in the language of Latin. Um, the, the person found with an illegal Bible during this time could actually be executed. So, I mean, this was like, this was serious stuff. This was a huge offense. Um, what was really going on behind the scenes, though, was that the church was corrupt. It was led by priests who were hungry for power. Um, they, were, they, were, they had uh, gotten to where they were controlling the civil, the political, uh, the religious world, because they were the only ones who could read the text of what God had written to man. So for anybody to try to make peace with God, they had to go through the priests who were the only one who had access and understanding uh, of what God said. And of course, they would use it. They would use that and leverage that power for their own benefit. And so that's what was going on. Um, uh, and so from 400 to 1400 A.D., Catholic priests used their influence of ignorance over the people to gain wealth, to gain influence, to gain power. This time period became known as the Dark Ages. And so uh, it, was a, it was a time when people were separated from God and their only access to God was by going through a priest who would usually charge you or do something for their own benefit. So... This is going on, this is going on. I mean, a long time this happens. How does the church break free? How does, you know, this corruption and this darkness end? How did we ever get to where we are today from, you know, the Bible being controlled and manipulated and only being allowed in one language? And if you had a different copy, I mean, you were subject to literal execution. How did we get past that? Well, here we go. In 563, a man named Columbo, not the... Uh, not the uh, TV detective, a different Columbo. Uh, a man named Columbo started a secret Bible society known as the Chaldees that was commissioned to faithfully teach God's Word. And they did, they did this. They met in secrecy and they taught underground. For 700 years, the Chaldees would faithfully study and teach God's Word. Then, in the late 1300s, one of the Chaldees, whose name was John Wycliffe, was the first person to translate the Bible back into English. English. So John Wycliffe, in the 1300s, translates the Bible into English. The significance of that is that now people, just everyday common, ordinary people, not priests up in the, you know, the, the church, not those guys, everyday people, now they can read and understand the written words of God. That's huge. The problem with this was that it would take about 10 months to, to copy these, these English translations. So while it was, you know, it had been translated and it was readable and it was understandable, it still wasn't accessible because it would take 10 months just to produce one copy of Wycliffe's English translation. So there's still a lot of people in the dark, and, and, and the Catholic Church still had a lot of control over the Bible. Um, Wycliffe was identified as a heretic by the Council of Constance. He was so hated by the Catholic Church that 44 years after his death, Pope Martin V ordered his bones to be dug up, burned, and his ashes scattered over the River Swift. I mean, you know, you got, you got to understand, the Catholic Church is, I mean, they got it going on. They're living it up. They've got control, power, and influence. And then all of a sudden, Wycliffe has written a book or has, has translated the book into a version that everyday people can read. And this is like, this, this could cause the roots of the power of the Catholic Church to literally just crumble. So he's labeled a heretic, and they hate him so much that, I mean, 44 years after the guy's dead, they dig him up and scatter his ashes across the river. Like, they hate this guy. So one of Wycliffe's students was a Czechoslovakian priest named Jan Hus. Hus is considered to be the first church reformer. He was also labeled a heretic by the Catholic Church and was burned at the stake. So Wycliffe, he, he, he transformed the text of the Bible into English. Jan Hus started saying, he started poking at the church and saying, you guys are wrong. You guys are wrong. Well, you know, they, burned, they killed him, they burned him at the stake. His executioners used his teachers 
um, Wycliffe's English Bibles as fuel for the fire when they burn Huss at the stake. So they take, they round up as many Wycliffe Bibles as they can, they pile them up, and they burn Huss at the stake by burning Wycliffe's Bibles. At his death, Jan Huss made this statement. In the next 100 years, God will raise up a man whose call for reform cannot be suppressed. Those were his dying words, and they turned out to be prophetic words. Because that's exactly what God did. In the year 1517, God raised up a man named Martin Luther to help reform the church. On All Hallows' Eve, Luther took his famous document called the 95 Theses, which was a list of 95 heresies of the Catholic Church, and he nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. And that started a, that literally started a revolution. Luther knocked on the door of the church and left, and that knock became uh, known, uh, famously known as the knock that was heard around the world. And, and that act by Martin Luther was what sparked what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. It was when the, the Catholic Church began to lose its power over the common people. Luther translated the Bible into German, um, and his German Bible uh, was translated about the time that Johann Gutenberg's printing press was invented. So Luther's Bible began to be churned out on the newly invented printed, printing press. And so now Luther's Bible was able to be distributed and, and be placed into the hands of a, a ton of people. So now all of a sudden, I mean, the Catholic Church is crumbling. I mean, their, their power is, is it's threat, totally threatened. Luther's Bible is being printed on the new printing press. It's being distributed among people who can read German. And so in 1526, another guy shows up. He's a friend of Luther's. His name was William Tyndale. Tyndale translated the Bible into English directly from the original Hebrew and Greek texts. So this was a direct translation of the Bible straight from the Old Testament Hebrew, straight from the New Testament Greek text. And it was the first English Bible to be printed in mass on Gutenberg's printing press. So now the Germans are reading it. The, the people who can read English, they're reading it. And it's, and it's just spreading all over the place. The Roman Catholic Church issued a ruling that anyone caught with Tyndale's Bible would be put to death. With such a high demand, a huge effort began to smuggle Tyndale's English Bibles back into English, back into England. Tyndale was on the run for 11 years of his life. He was finally caught and he was imprisoned for 500 days by the Roman Catholic Church. After 500 days of being incarcerated, they decided to, to burn him at the stake. And so as Tyndale was being burned at the stake, this was his dying words. O oh Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Those were his dying words. That was his prayer as he was being burned at the stake. Three years later, in 1539, the king of England, King Henry VIII, changed everything because he not only allowed the Bible uh, to be in English, he not only allowed people to have English Bibles, but he started funding the printing of English Bibles. And so... We saw, you know, Jan Huss's dying prayer that was prophetic come true. Now we see William Tyndale's dying prayer. It comes true. King Henry VIII starts funding, I mean, literally funding the printing of English Bibles. So this is a total turnaround. So just, you know, as we close this section, think about this. Think about behind this collection of books that we call the Bible, there is this, this rich history behind it, of, of God's sovereignty and God's providence uh, that has sustained its existence, even, even during those years of the Dark Ages when, you know, when people tried to control it and, and use it for their own power and their own influence, even during those times, God's sovereign hand was on his word. And he used men, and, and there were men and women who, I mean, they literally gave their lives, and they were beaten and tortured and sacrificed just to have a, a copy of what many Americans just have laying on their coffee table collecting dust. 
And so that's what I want us to have an appreciation for is this book that we have access to so readily called the Bible. People have died for it. People have fought for it. People have, you know, crouched down in corners just to read a few words that, were, that are written in it. And so it's an amazing living uh, liter- piece of literature that we have access to. And we, we don't ever need to uh, not have an appreciation for it or, or, or not ever cherish it because it is, it is an amazing thing. And once again, it is, it's God's word. It's God's word that has been handed down through generation after generation after generation. And now we stand here and we have access to it and we can read it and we can hear what God has to say to us today through it. So the, the Bible is amazing. I mean, it's just an incredible book. So um, uh, I hope it, it, you know, it, it heightens and raises your appreciation for what it is, um, you know, as, not just as a collection of books, but as God's written word. Uh, people have tried to end it. They've tried to burn it. They've tried to collect it and dump it. They've, they've tried everything that they could to get rid of it. And yet, here we are. Christianity is the largest religion on the face of the planet. So, amazing book.